Hi everyone, so today I'm going to talk about SDN controllers in the context of the wide area network. What I'll do in the first few minutes is give an introduction into the concept and then I will go on and talk about the enabling protocols needed to create a controller for the wide area network that operates in quasi real time. And so I'll talk about BGPLS, which gives a controller visibility of the current topology of the network and PSEP, which allows the controller to create new LSPs completely from scratch and to modify existing ones. And then in the second half of the talk, I want to talk about some of the applications of this type of controller. A classic one is path diversity, but also I want to talk about ones which are driven by telemetry data received from the network, things like automated congestion avoidance, where you move LSPs um, away from congestion hotspots that you've detected using telemetry, or moving away low latency LSPs from paths where the latency's suddenly gone through a step change increase in latency. So here's the concept behind this type of um, controller. The key point that I want to make is that it's a live controller um, directly coupled to the um, production network, as opposed to being a sort of offline planning tool or a passive monitoring tool. And so it's taking part in some of the control plane um, protocols of the network to allow it to have this very strong um, coupling with the network itself. And it's receiving inputs from three main sources, as you can see by those blue arrows. So first of all, from the network itself, it's um, got visibility of the network topology through BGPLS. It's got a lot of streaming telemetry coming in, giving it information about what's currently going on in the network, and also LSP status um, through the PSEP protocol. And then also it's receiving inputs from a human operator via a UI, and also inputs from higher layer systems via a northbound REST API. And so on the basis of those inputs, it's making decisions about the paths that traffic engineered LSPs should take across the network. And it can be modifying the paths of existing LSPs or creating new ones completely from um, scratch. Now, this type of control has been shipping for different, um, three years now, and it's deployed in a variety of um, different types of networks, so ranging from telcos, um, ISPs, um, international transit providers, and high-end enterprises as well. Now, this slide really is um, the key one of the entire um, presentation, really, because what it's showing is a diagram of a closed loop automation system. And these, of course, are very familiar in many parts of engineering. Um, the same style of block diagram could apply to a cruise control on a car or the air conditioning system in a building. And so what you have, um, starting on the left-hand side, is the user requirements. What does the user want from this network? How does it want certain traffic to be handled? And so then the next con controller is performing path computations and actually installing um, traffic engineered paths into the network itself or modifying existing ones. But then the network is um, a sort of living creature and so you've got outside disturbances that are affecting it. You could have outages, you know, fiber cut. You could have changing traffic patterns causing um, congestion. And so you need a way of measuring what the current state of the network is. And so that's where the telemetry plays a very important part. So by um, providing telemetry, such as what is the traffic on each physical link, what's the traffic traveling along each um, traffic engineered NSP, what's the latency currently of each link in the network, um, what are packet drop counts on each link, and that, coupled with um, you know, certain protocol um, information, gives the controller a good visibility of what's going on in the network. And so that comprises the feedback part of this um, control loop. And so it takes that into account when doing its um, computation. So this is um, you know, a classical control system applied to um, networking. And as you heard on Monday from the Google talk, streaming telemetry is you know, far superior to SNMP to acquire this type of data in quasi real time. You can um, send it at much higher frequencies and also it's much more accurate because you're not suffering from those um, averaging artifacts that we saw um, discussed on Monday. Now let's have a look at a couple of the um, enabling protocols that I've alluded to. So first of all, um, BGPLS. So BGPLS is the means by which the controller has visibility of the topology of the network. So the layout of the links and 
nodes and attributes of the links that the controller needs to know. Now, this diagram by of example is showing a multi-area network. So it could be multiple ISIS areas, as denoted by those dashed lines, or it could even be a multi-AS network. Now, um, the scope of um, traffic engineering IGP extensions is per um, area, intra-area. And so, for example, router E in this diagram would know about the link between B and D and its attributes, or the link between D and F, but would know nothing about the existence of router H is linked to K and the attributes there. And so the controller needs visibility into each of these areas. One way it can achieve that, you could just have an IGP peering between the controller and each of those areas. But the controller is probably not directly physically connected into those areas. And so you'd end up having to do um, you know, an IGP adjacency over GRE tunnels or something like that, which gets a bit messy. Instead, you can use BGPLS. So a BGPLS speaker. Um, takes the contents of the traffic engineering database, um, other IGP information, packages it up into um, TLVs and you know, communicates those of the BGP. And so then um, by having you know, a BGP LS speaker in each of these regions, perhaps peering with a couple of route reflectors and those peering with the controller, in that way the controller can ingest all of the topology information network-wide. It can um, actually combine it into a unified end-to-end -end view in its own mind, and so can successfully create end-to-end -end LSPs across this multi-domain topology, which is notoriously difficult, as you know, in the distributed traffic engineering case. Now, um, a couple more words about the um, nuts and bolts behind BGPLS. So what it's doing is um, it's using TLVs to describe nodes, um, things like IP4, IP v6 um, loopback addresses, ISO address if it's an ISIS speaker, and then for link attributes, things like what's the bandwidth of this link, um, any admin groups that have been con um, configured, IGP metric, and also things like adjacency SIDs if um, segment routing is being used because those are covered, covered by um, traffic engineering extensions to BGPLS. So that's BGPLS in a nutshell. Now, the other protocol which I want to talk about is Path Computation Element Protocol, or PSEP for short. Now, what this has on the one hand is the Path Computation Element, which is the um, central controller, and then you have um, PCCs, Path Computation Clients, which are the ingress routers of the LSPs that we're going to set up. And then between the PCE and each PCC, you have a PSEP session. And over that PSEP session, um, the controller can um, create new LSPs completely from scratch, or could modify existing um, LSPs. And very importantly, PSEP is a bidirectional protocol, and so the reporting in the opposite direction from the PCC to the controller is very useful, because that's how the controller knows that an LSP that's just been requested to be set up indeed has been set up according to its requirements. And during the lifetime of the LSP, it allows the controller to know that the LSP is still intact and up and running. Now, in a network, um, you know, in principle, you could have three different types of LSP from the PSEP point of view. And so what I'll do is talk about each of those in turn. So this is what I call a vanilla LSP. So this LSP could have been configured on the ingress router you know, months or years ago in the traditional way using um, CLI config. And if you turn on PSEP on this network and attach a controller, what will happen is that all of these LSPs will be automatically reported to the controller um, via PSEP. And so the controller will be aware of the existence of all of these LSPs and all of their attributes, the precise path that the LSP is following across the network, um, a bandwidth reservation if it's an RSVP um, LSP, and so on. And so from the visualization point of view, this is very useful because you can see um, the path of the LSP in the UI of the controller, which is much easier than poking around in the CLI of um, the respective ingress routers around the um, network. Now, the PCE is not authorized to modify um, this type of LSP. It's not been granted um, permission. On the other hand, there's another type of LSP, which is delegated one. And in fact, the LSP that we saw in the previous example, you could convert into a delegated LSP. So typically, it's just a couple of lines of extra CLI config on the ingress router, which um, is giving delegation to the controller. And so what will happen is a PSEP message is sent from the ingress router to the controller saying, this LSPY, um, I'm delegating it to you. Um, you've got permission to make modifications. 
And then over the lifetime of the LSP, the controller can modify the path of the LSP as needed, for example, to avoid congestion or to um, allow maintenance on a node that the LSP um, passes through. And so to do that, it would send a PSEP message to the ingress router, PSEP update message saying, this LSP, um, I want to change its path from ABC to XYZ. And so the um, ingress router responds by modifying the path um, accordingly. And then the final type of LSP is PC initiated. So that's one that's actually created by the controller from scratch. So the first thing that the ingress router knows is that it suddenly receives a PSEP message, a PC initiate message from the controller saying, hey, I want you to set up this new LSP. This is the name of the LSP. This is the precise ERO that I want um, the LSP to follow. Um, other attributes, bandwidth reservation, if it's an RSVP um, LSP. It will have a flag saying whether it's um, to be instantiated using segment routing or um, RSVP. And so then the ingress router actually instantiates it, and very importantly sends a PSEP um, report message back to the controller saying, yes, you know, this LSP is up and running um, in accordance with the requirements that you um, stipulated. And so in that way, the controller knows that what it's asked for is what actually exists in the um, network. So that's PSEP in a nutshell. Um, let's now have a look in particular at PSEP for um, segment routing. So with that, one way of creating a traffic engineered um, SR LSP is by um, encoding it as a stack of adjacency labels. So if you've got um, n hops in the end-to-end -end path, then you'll have n minus one adjacency labels because you don't need a label for the first hop because the ingress router just pushes it in the required direction onto the required link. And so the controller has been asked to compute this um, LSP shown in green. Perhaps it's the lowest latency path between A and Y. It's computed the path as A, L, M, N, Y. It's looking at what the adjacency labels are on each link, which it knows through MBGPLS. And so to make the um, traffic follow that path, you need a label stack 406, um, 607, um, 708. And so the PSEP message sent by the controller will have that label stack, um, the associated IP addresses. Um, and so router A receiving that will actually um, instantiate that in its ribbon fib. And so it will put in an entry typically pointing to router Y's um, loopback address. And so traffic going to um, destination Y would resolve over that. So that's how you deal with the um, segment routing using PSEP and controllers. So I've talked about the enabling protocols and other um, ingredients such as telemetry. Let's have a, have a look at some applications. One very um, popular application is for path diversity. So um, you have um, end customers migrating away from Sonnet SDH private circuits. They want something of a similar you know, sort of look and feel. Um, and often when they buy a private circuit between two different um, cities, rather than just buying one single circuit, they'll buy a pair for resilience. And they want those two um, pairs to be diversely routed. They mustn't share any links or nodes in common so that if something breaks in the network, at most only one of those will be um, affected. So you need a pair of LSPs to underpin you know, that diverse pseudo-wire um, service, let's say. And those two LSPs are of equal status. It's not really primary, secondary. Both are up and running and active at the same time, and the customer can use them as they want. They could ECMP traffic. Um, some customers actually deliberately send duplicate traffic down both LSPs simultaneously for things like broadcast TV contribution feeds or um, you know, financial market data feeds. Um, it could be point-to-point -point, um, LSPs or equally point-to-multipoint LSPs. And so then you need to do a diverse path computation for the point-to-multipoint. LSP pair. Now, the thing is, if you ask the two um, ingress routers, PE1 and PE2, to do the path computation, then there's no mechanism for them to collaborate as to making them diverse. Um, there's no protocol mechanism for that. And so they would each do their path computation independently. And in this um, diagram, where you've got lots of ECMP paths in the network, there's only one chance in 16 that they're actually going to be diverse. So 15 times out of 16, they're going to share fate as shown in this example, where actually they've got a node in common somewhere in the middle of the network, which means we're violating the path diversity um, service requirements. In contrast, if you tell the controller, look, I want a pair of um, LSPs, I want them to be diverse, these are the ingress routers, these are the egress routers, it will do the path um, computation as a simultaneous path computation, bearing the diversity requirements into account, and it will do it properly, and you end up with something like this, which is what you want from your 
service point of view. Another um, class of use case which I think is extremely interesting, this is my um, favourite one, is, you know, it's going back to this closed-loop automation which I talked about near the beginning of the talk. So the controller knows through streaming telemetry how much traffic is travelling along each physical link. It knows through streaming telemetry how much traffic is being launched into each individual traffic engineer's LSP. And so you could set a threshold. You could say, OK, if the traffic on any physical link exceeds 90%, then move away some LSPs automatically to mitigate the congestion. And so in this example, um, in fact, um, the link, which is coloured red, has um, exceeded that threshold. And so the controller looks at what LSPs are passing through that link, and it decides which LSP or which LSPs are best to move away to ease the congestion. And of course, in so doing, it needs to redo the path computation such that it's not causing um, congestion elsewhere. And so having recomputed the paths of um, some of those LSPs, it sends PSET messages to the ingress routers with the details of the new paths, and um, the ingress routers move the LSPs and make the four brake manners. So you're not actually um, interrupting the traffic. And so in this example, the blue LSP has been chosen to be moved and gets them moved away, and so eases the congestion on that link that had been um, congested. And so this is a fully automated closed-loop um, automation. So traditionally, this type of so-called traffic engineering people have done manually. Um, it's quite labor-intensive. You know, somebody's got to realize that a link's got, um, you know, towards a congestion point. They need to recompute the paths of some LSPs. It's quite tricky to do that manually. Um, then they need to log on to the ingress routers and put in some loose hops to pin um, the LSP away from the congested area. Um, after a few months of doing this, you end up with a rat's nest of LSPs which have been pinned around the network in all sorts of um, different ways, and unraveling it can be quite messy because the reason why some of those LSPs have been pinned in a certain way may have gone away. So having a controller do all of this you know, entirely automatically makes a lot of sense, as you can imagine. There's other triggers for moving LSPs. I mean, this congestion was one example, but another trigger could be interface error counts. And so um, a sort of really insidious type of fault is you know, the so-called grey fault, where an interface is still up and running from the protocol's point of view, BFD um, packets are still getting through, but perhaps you're losing one in a thousand packets or so, which could be enough to um, disrupt some end user applications. And so the controller, um, seeing these interface error accounts, can decide to move away LSPs from the affected links so that somebody can troubleshoot, perhaps clean the fibers and um, things like that. Um, another trigger can be queue high watermarks. So if you've got telemetry that is actually reporting what's the highest fill level of each queue on the link, you know, has a queue got towards, um, you know, in danger of overspilling? And so proactively you can move traffic away onto other links to prevent, you know, microbursts actually overspilling um, that link. And planned maintenance as well. It doesn't have to be telemetry driven motivation for moving the LSP. It could be you saying at 2 a.m. I want this node to um, be put into maintenance and so automatically the controller moves away all the LSPs just before um, that 2 a.m. Um, start time. Another um, angle is programmable cost functions. So typically these controllers by default are going to um, compute the shortest IGP metric path that meets the other requirements of the LSP, such as path diversity or bandwidth requirements. And so in this example, given these IGP metrics, the lowest um, you know, metric path between X and Y is as shown by that blue arrow. On the other hand, people might have low latency traffic and um, that um, low latency path could be different from the lowest um, IGP metric path, especially if the lowest IGP metric path denotes monetary cost. Classic example is if you're sending traffic from London to Singapore, the lowest latency way of doing it is directly eastwards around the globe, but the lowest monetary cost is send it the long way around the um, globe, you know, sort of westwards, which is more than twice the um, latency. And so you only want to put the latency-sensitive traffic onto the low-latency LSP. And so what you need is a means to, first of all, um, know what the latency is. And so what would happen is the routers are um, measuring the latencies to their nearest neighbors using um, timestamp packets, something like TWAMP, reporting that with streaming telemetry to the controller. And so the controller can see what the latency is on each physical link at this moment in time. And so in fact, at the moment, the lowest latency path between X and Y is um, on the north side of the network, um, in contrast to the lowest IGP metric path, which as you'll remember was on the south side of the um, network. 
Looking at this latency type of use case in a bit more detail, um, often you get um, network operators renting capacity from WAN providers. So um, this might be a global network. Um, you've got this operator renting capacity on um, transoceanic cables from WAN provider X and WAN provider Y to give some degree of um, resilience. Um, what can sometimes happen is that you get a step change in latency, um, which you don't know exactly why it happened. It might be a fiber cut within one of these WAN providers, but you need to mitigate against it. And so in this example, at the moment, the latencies are shown by those numbers on each link. Um, the dominant latency is across these transoceanic cables. And at the moment, the lowest latency between PE1 and PE2 is um, as shown by that red um, LSP. And the control has computed that path as being indeed the lowest latency um, path. Now, what happens, um, there's a fiber cut in one provider Y, step change in latency on that link from 11 to 23. The controller sees that through the telemetry reports, and so it automatically reassesses the paths of all the low latency LSP that pass through that link. It redoes the path computation, and now the best path for this um, red LSP is along the north side of the network through WAN provider X. And so the controller sends a PSEP message to the ingress router via PSEP saying, this is the new path for this LSP, and um, PE1 being the ingress rate, um, router um, changes the path in a make before break manner, so you're not affecting any of the traffic. Again, um, you know, if you're doing this manually, somebody's got to notice, first of all, that the latency's gone up. It might be the end customers who start complaining because their applications are misbehaving. Then you've got to you know, work out what the latency now is on each link, um, redo the path computation, um, you know, configure a new ERO on the ingress route. So you know, quite labor intensive and cumbersome. So doing it um, you know, completely automatically in this closed loop manner you know, is obviously a lot more efficient. So that brings me more or less to the end. Um, a few references if you're interested in learning more about this whole topic area. First of all, um, a webinar, the first URL, which is a deep dive into um, PCEP and BGPLS. So this really goes into the nuts and bolts. It shows packet dumps, for example, PCEP packet dumps when um, you have a PCE initiated LSP. What does that PC initiate message look like? What's the message that goes back to the controller from the ingress router, things like that. Um, then a reference um, linked to the PSEP working groups. There's 10 years worth of drafts and RFCs um, stretching back um, over time. You know, you'll see recent ones like PSEP extensions for point to multi point LSPs, PSEP extensions for um, segment routing. Um, then the BGPLS RFC. If you're interested in particular implementations, you can read about ours, which is called North Star. And then finally, a few blogs which I've written on related topics. So that's it. Thanks a lot for your attention. I don't know if anyone wants to ask any questions, or if not, I'll be around um, you know, in the hallways afterwards. So thanks a lot for your attention. OK, no questions. Thanks a lot.